members, I'm sure. Um, by way of brief introduction, uh, Fedor Panov is one of our epilepsy neurosurgeons, functional neurosurgeons here at Mount Sinai. He trained at Jefferson and then did his residency here at Sinai, followed by a fellowship at UCSF in functional neurosurgery and epilepsy. Um, he is an excellent epilepsy surgeon, a very thoughtful epilepsy surgeon who really considers the literature and the research on the subject. And he's a really interesting talk for you today that I'm looking forward to hearing myself. So I'll let him take it away from there. Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, we'll go ahead and share the slides. And we'll get going fast because there's a lot of slides. But again, I want to just restate, please, guys, interrupt any time. And if you see that I'm on a roll and I can't see it, just feel free to speak up. Uh, this works very well if we're able to kind of go through this together. And believe me, I'm going to learn as much from you and your feedback on this talk as, uh, uh, as I do from any other time that we present this. So the title here is going to be Minimally Invasive Neuromodulation, specifically with the intraoperative MRI system. What I wanted to focus on is sort of the new frontier of neurosurgery. It's been around now for about 14 years and how we can apply that into the future. But we most certainly are going to start with disclosures and uh, a brief outline. So we'll talk about the history. How have we gotten here in neuromodulation? We'll take a look at the current state and what it allows us to do. And then of course, the future directions, which is a really exciting part of this talk. So let's go back to the basics. Neuromodulation surgery, what is the goal of these procedures? Well, we try to get to the correct target uh, with accurate and precise delivery of either an electrode or a laser uh, or even some things that no longer require us to make a perforation in the skull, like the high intensity ultrasound. And what we want out of neuromodulation is appropriate clinical outcome while minimizing complications and side effects. So those are just the basic tenets of what we're going for. Um, this one is wonderful um, as, a, as a way to break the ice during these talks. So how did we get to this point? How are we now able to precisely get to areas of the brain um, over the last hundred years, there have been a lot of advances, but let's go back even further. Uh, and the best way to think of this is I have the privilege of seeing this bridge twice in my commute to work and on my commute back on the subway as we surface on Manhattan Bridge to look over at the Brooklyn Bridge. We really need to know how it was built to truly appreciate that structure. And the same thing about my one year at UCSF. You can see the Golden Gate Bridge, but if you truly go back to when they had to build it and what they had to go through, um, it becomes just so much more impressive and you really do want to stand on the shoulders of giants in our field as well. So let's go back before the current era, uh, back to the Edwin Smith papyrus, and the first example of the written word brain. Now, this was in the case of traumatic brain injury in somebody with aphasia, case number 20 from the papyrus itself. And unfortunately, treatments were not as well developed at the time. This was comfort care only, I believe, with uh, alligator dung and some of the other things we would probably not consider standard of care. Here's what the Edison papyrus looked like. Uh, and this is a great image to carry with you. That is one of the first uh, writings of the human brain as a term. And you can see it kind of makes sense, right? You have a head here and maybe a couple of scalpels. I'm sure the bird's not good news either. Now the BCAD interchange, so we're jumping about 1700 years into the future. Um, was tough, but we were making some advancements. Torpedo Nobiliana was one of the first neuromodulation devices able to deliver about 220 volts or so per contact. Uh, Scribinus Largus used it at this BCAD interchange to treat gout and headaches. And then a thousand years later, there's writings that Ibn Sena or Avicenna used it as well to treat depression. What is this thing? Well, it's uh, an electric eel and it's uh, common around the Mediterranean. And you can see the technical difficulties of using this neuromodulation device, yet the first device that we had. So we had to work with what we had at the time. Uh, this is Ibn Sena, again, active around 10th and 11th century, around Isfahan. And unfortunately, even with his studies, there was so much restriction on development in medicine because of uh, prohibitions to uh, cadaveric research. So for about a thousand years since the fall of the Roman Empire uh, through the end of the Dark Ages, there really was not a lot of advancement. Um, and if you guys want to, here's a pitch for a movie you should all watch, The Physician, starring Ben Kingsley as uh, Ibn Sena. So the Dark Ages, and here we have it as a joke, you know, lack of neuromodulation. And here this was mostly a misunderstanding of the patient population itself. 
we were thinking of epileptics and dystonics as possessed witches and warlocks. Uh, an incredibly evil book, Malleus Maleficarum, came out in the 15th century. And because of the guidance of this book, most of the patients were burned at the stake. And think of this, right? So if your disorder like seizures is considered infectious, you're not going to get the treatment that you need. So here's the copy of Malleus Maleficarum. Um, and here's the rapid spread of this unfortunate way of treatment to the new world. And here you can see the, the Salem witch trials in the lower right-hand corner. Early invasive neuromodulation. Here we have to go to the beginning of the 19th century, so 1805 or so um, in uh, London. Giovanni Aldini uh, was allowed to experiment on recently beheaded and hung prisoners. And this was the first recorded successful cortical stimulation in human beings, albeit recently dead ones. Uh, contralateral facial grimace was exhibited by hemispheric stimulation. That's the guy, and that's him chasing uh, observers away as he's trying to rejuvenate a corpse. This made an impression on this uh, young woman. And uh, that, of course, is Mary Shelley. And she created Frankenstein from some of these early life experiences in the squares of Victorian London. Um, again, difficult to overstate how much this has put our field back. Uh, the amount of times we hear that neuromodulation will turn somebody into a cyborg or Frankenstein is disheartening. And it's all of our jobs to try to fight that as much as we can by sharing the correct information and decreasing the anxiety of the patients. More neuromodulation targets another jump about 150 years or so, and this is Irving Cooper. Uh, in 1952, he was doing a subtemporal approach, and he ended up injuring one of the vessels, the anterior choroidal. Uh, the disappearance of the tremor afterwards had no complications and no other side effects. So the tremor got better, the rigidity got better, hemiparesis was not an issue. So from that point on, they thought they were onto something, and they started lesioning the areas where uh, they perceived the anterior choroidal uh, artery was supplying. Uh, they lesioned with alcohol um, and eventually spread this over to globus pallidus interna and the thalamus. Cryosurgery was also tried, creating a reversible lesion during the wake surgery. And here's an outline for you guys just to show where the anterior choroidal will be uh, and where he caused that injury. In parallel, we're starting to receive some of these advances in epilepsy surgery around, again, the 1950s. Stereo G, then the creation of the Telerac grid around the same time in France. The basis of the ACPC coordinates, which is how we still describe a lot about the human brain. And of course, then resective surgeries leading over to potential diagnostic minimally invasive surgeries like you have here. And that would be the stereo EEG itself. Here's a great image of the Telerac grid being used initially for a stereo. You can see these leads go in orthogonally and get plugged in. Uh, and we have most certainly have made developments since then. Here's one of the bases of the way surgeries were done. And this is a ventriculography, a horrifically painful procedure where they had to do a lumbar puncture and then inject air and spin you around in a chair that was tied to a wall. Um, and if you ever have a patient who has intracranial air, you know they have a headache. So here you are on purpose displacing the CSF with air to be able to see it on an x-ray. Um, and the level of pain from this was tremendous. And here you can see um, a DBS lead advancing to target based on the ACPC coordinates. And why do we use ACPC coordinates? Because you could see them on a lateral x-ray with a ventriculography. Indirect targeting uh, really grew out of some of these other methods before we had good imaging. And this is the utilization of a tiny little electrode that is able to sense uh, single units, so single neurons firing, to map the activity of the deep brain structures and then try to map those recordings to the known sounds of the brain to try to tell you where you are. This indirect targeting was done for decades using this atlas. Um, and then, of course, we slowly came up with the idea that we would need um, awake surgeries. We would need multiple passes to get this done because the patients could not be asleep. To get the true recordings of the brain, you need them to be awake. And you needed to map out the territory, which means one track by itself was not enough. You had to do multiple. We talked about the Tyleric grid and again, the inference of other structures via x-rays. And this was really only valid for structures that are close enough to the ACPC and that are fairly resistant to potential uh, changes in their location uh, based on, for example, intracranial air or growth of lesions. So here's a good image of just how tiny the microelectrode actually is, right? If you're talking about up here, this is one millimeter and here you're down to 25 micrometers. In comparison, you see here the guide tubes and you see the current macro electrodes that we do place that are somewhere between one and two millimeters in diameter usually. And here's a description of the different sounds that you would hear from the central nervous system 
as you advance here towards your target. And in this case, you can verify the position of the GPI by advancing a little bit further over to the optic track. This is early 3D targeting. So they would take two shots of an X-ray lateral uh, during a cerebral angiogram, and they would offset it by six degrees. And then they would have you wear these special glasses right down here, which would allow you to recreate the sense of three-dimensionality uh, by basically a visual illusion. And that allowed them to say, well, this area right here, and I'm sorry if you guys can't see my, my mark, it's, um, but just look at the areas where the vessels are not as dense. That would be the location where you would place your stereo G lead and consider that a safe passageway. We certainly have gotten better and uh, the morbidity and mortality of these procedures continues to improve. And now we jump to neuromodulation. Uh, some of my mentors who were starting their fellowships in the early to mid 1990s showed up and they were told, no, we're no longer gonna lesion. We're gonna actually neuromodulate. We're gonna place an electrode there with contacts that are able to reversibly create a lesion and then whenever the electricity stops flowing, that lesion should dissipate. And the giants in the field here are definitely Benabit and DeLong, and most of their work that was done down at Emory. Here you can see the beginning of not just contacts, but contacts that can potentially steer the current, allow us to influence to the left more than to the right, which is incredibly important at DBS, where you're surrounded by structures that can cause complications and side effects to the patient if they're stimulated. This allows us to drive the current away from those structures and towards the beneficial area. And here's an example of how that current can be steered. And of course, we're always remembering, we're following in the footsteps of truly the cardiac industry. The first cardiac pacemakers uh, were created around the 1940s, 1950s. And the best reason that I can explain to you why our neuromodulators look the way they do is this. At the time, a shoe polish can was easy to be mass produced. So the early cardiac uh, implants used this as the case. So now we still kind of use things that look like this. So again, patient comfort was not part of the design and we have to keep on fighting to try to get that better. So the current state, we have several different types of deep brain stimulation. And right now we have one type of responsive neuromodulation with things continuously entering the market that are trying to improve on this. We have the classic Medtronic device, we have Boston Scientific and we have Abbott. And for responsive neuromodulation, mostly for epilepsy, we have responsive neuromodulation, RNS, Neuropace. And now let's jump to direct targeting, right? So now that we know more about the brain, now that we have MRI advances and functional imaging and infusion, improved fusion, can we really let some of these things go by the wayside that may not be necessary anymore? And this is where we're talking about direct targeting, being able to visualize your target on a specific MRI sequence and guiding your lead or laser or treatment directly to it. Well, here's an example of a really good MP-RAGE sequence that allows you to see inside of the thalamus. And you can see if we're aiming for the central median nucleus, it becomes much easier to decipher it. Whereas most of the other thalamic sequences uh, try to get this better. If you look at a regular T1, the entire thalamus is just a gray blur. Here you can see some more images of uh, segmentation of the thalamus itself to help us guide to these targets. And of course we can use functional imaging to be able to correlate the connectivity from any spot that we want to stimulate to where in the brain it's most likely to affect the patient. Here's some more fusion algorithms that have gotten exceedingly well going between the MRI, the CAT scan and the PET scan. Now live direct targeting is the next step and that's the intraoperative MRI that we're gonna to discuss today. So this would utilize patient specific MRI sequences, no longer Atlas based, no longer microelectrode recording based but truly visualizing the target itself and placing the lead and confirming that the lead is at target before closing up. The flexibility of this is tremendous. It allows you to adjust for intraoperative events. Let's say a lot of intracranial air sneaks in and you have shift, you can adjust for it. Uh, deviation of the instrument and the target. You can actually see your probe slowly advancing to the correct target. And if you see with three centimeters to go that you're bound to be projecting forward, you know, uh, eight millimeters to the side, you correct that deviation before you actually make that perforation. And of course, you do not need to rely on the fusion, which means that this inherent additional error of fusing things together uh, is gone. So review, what have we done in recent modern neuromodulation over the past uh, 50 to 70 years? So from the Tellerite grid and ventriculography, going over through lesioning, directional leads, and then direct targeting. Again, going from the implantations in Hospital St. Anne in France for the first stereo G, 
and the ventriculographies over to this direct targeting that allows you know, Peter and I to ablate the mesial temporal lobe. And you can see the effect of that surgery uh, in the middle on top in that coronal T2 MRI. You can see the increased signal around the mesial temporal lobe on the left. Directional leads, and what we'll talk about for the next few minutes would be the direct targeting. And if you guys see a Mickey Mouse face here that's making a surprising O expression, then you will never forget where you need to target in the STN to get good results for a Parkinsonian patient. So here's from one of the uh, book chapters that we wrote together with uh, Phil Starr and Paul Larson over at UCSF. You can see the cerebral aqueduct is going to be the mouth of Mickey Mouse. The red nucleus is the eye. And then the eyebrow is the STN. Here's to bring that uh, fully home. So where did this live direct targeting or IMRI originate? Well, 2007 at UCSF, they tried out some of these techniques. And at the time we had no idea what the infection rate was gonna be or how this was gonna go. This is um, an entirely in the MRI procedure. So of course, everything has to be MRI compatible. But at the time, Dr. Starr had to wear one of these spacesuits they were trying to still get to the point where they had enough patients to be able to say the infection rate is staying down because of the minimal invasive nature of it and the rapidity with which you can do this case, which again, decreases the chance of infection. Um, you know, forward 13 years, Mount Sinai Hospital, and now we have a better setup on a 3T magnet, uh, a lot more room, but the basics of the procedure itself are still the same. And we'll go through that together. So again, the entire procedure is performed in the MRI suite. The only things that happen outside would be the intubation and the placement of lines because the equipment for that uh, does not have to be MRI compatible as long as you can do it before you roll the patient into the room. So this is the setup of our 3T magnet over at Mount Sinai West. And you can see that those big metal doors in the back of the picture open up and connect us to an operating room if needs be. This is uh, Peter, unfortunately recently retired, uh, one of our excellent scrub techs. And on the left, you can see the screen that allows us to communicate and see what the software is um, uh, doing regarding current direction of uh, aiming of the probes themselves. All MRI compatible instruments, usually titanium. Uh, we think of titanium as a strong metal. Unfortunately, it is not, and these do get used up and bent. So we have to keep a very close eye on the instruments. MRI compatible drills, which are available, but they will change in the frequency of uh, rotation based on how you direct them towards the isocenter of the MRI scanner. So it takes a little bit getting used to knowing that if you change the rotation of the drill uh, or the angle of the drill, actually the speed of the drilling will change. So here's an MRI compatible head holder. Uh, this has been updated and it's now much slicker looking, but the goal is still to make sure that the patient's head does not move relative to the isocenter of the MRI scanner. And this is achieved by pinning after the patient is uh, intubated and sedated. So here's the entire setup. This is actually one of our laser cases. So the patient is prone on this table, getting wrapped up and uh, comfy and cozy prior to being taken to the ISO center and then pass that to the back of the bore of this uh, 3T magnet. You can see the screening beforehand is incredibly important to assure that no one walks in with ferromagnetic anything on them, which could potentially really harm the magnet or most importantly, of course, the patient. And here's the setup in these photos. Uh, the photo on the left is through the communication booth with the MRI techs. Uh, on the right, you can see the initial targeting grids that we can place. And the hair shape for this is minimal. In this case, we shave the whole head, but you can do this with a minimal hair shape uh, because these stickies go onto the top of the hair if needs be. The mini frame is something that we attach to the skull. Uh, after the first targeting MRI is done. And ClearPoint is one of the companies that helps us do that. And this is what it looks like. And uh, it locks into the outer table of the skull straight through the skin. And it leaves tiny little um, dots where the actual screws entered and those heal very nicely and do not need anything uh, to close those incisions. So here you can see us at work once everything is draped and we're actually using a handheld drill to get through the outer table, cancelous bone and inner table prior to passing the laser probe to target. And this right here would be the handheld controllers, which allow us to change the trajectory of this by spinning the little colorful knobs while the patient's actually deep inside into the isocenter of the scanner itself. So here's an example of what this would look like prior to um, uh, incising of the skin. You can plan your trajectories and all these views, and you can make sure that you end up at target. And here now again, the hopefully now famous Mickey Mouse image that shows you the STN. 
And for targeting here, you want to be approximately two millimeters away from the medial edge of the STN or equivalent between the medial and the lateral border at the anterior most edge of the red nucleus. And that's where the target is shown for you guys. So on this next slide, you can see things have changed, right? So you can see that the skin has been opened bilaterally and you can see some of these uh, effects on the coronal on the upper left most clearly. And then uh, you can see that we're projecting forward with a radial error of 0.7 millimeters. You can see that little number in the, on the right-hand side. And here we're zooming in just to make it easier. The depth here doesn't really matter because we can always change the depth by just pulling back or pushing forward a little bit. So here now, not only is the head open uh, and the bone has been drilled through, but you can actually see the shadow of the ceramic stylet, which causes the least artifact and is able to give you a nice crisp image. And it's about halfway to target. And you can see on the right-hand side that the radial error is 0.3. So again, we're able to get submillimetric accuracy. And uh, just so you guys all remember, if you're within two millimeters of a target for deep brain stimulation, most likely the patient will have a good outcome. So two millimeters is kind of our cutoff. It's a bit artificial because historically, if the lead was closer than two millimeters and still not working, it was very hard to get it to head down a different channel. Uh, so if you're under two millimeters away from the target, people just thought it's really not worth revising. Uh, here we can get, you know, an order of magnitude better than that. So here again, a couple of different images. We're keeping our radial uh, error, which again is the error just specifically of one passage to the other. Uh, and you can see that's staying at 0.3 as we're advancing. Um, and uh, once you're at target, you can go ahead and get that last image. And now we do have compatible leads that allow us to place them and image in the MRI scanner at 3T, which is critical because then you can make sure and you're not sweating the depth as well. You don't have to pull anything back afterwards after getting a 1.5 MRI, which was the previous compatibility to these leads. Infection risk, as we discussed before, this is equivalent or better to classic DBS. So this study came out of UCSF and they showed that, again, these procedures are so quick uh, and they're mostly now done in either modified MRIs or into operating rooms that have the full sterility there and the ventilation of a true OR, which again, decreases even further these potential infection risks. So again, we've gone a long way in 13 years from having to wear that hood. So the benefits, and these are continuously expanding, right? So decrease in brain penetrations versus MER guided DBS. And remember in the microelectrode guided DBS, you have to pass the microelectrode through tissue and that is incredibly sharp. So you gotta be so careful to make sure that there's no vessels anywhere close. And some of the vessels are gonna be beyond the resolution of an MRI to see. Uh, the passage rate of a single pass at UCSF was 95%. By definition, MER guided DBS is the first pass is with MER and the second pass is with the macro electrode itself for the final placement. So you're already looking at at least two passes into the brain, out and back into the brain. At UCSF, 19 out of 20 were done with just a single pass. Target adjustment after brain shift is incredibly important. And of course, then the comfort general anesthesia to these patients, and they don't have to be without their Parkinsonian meds. That's another really important part. For MERs to really work, they have to be off their meds, and that is a hell day for them. So here's an example of brain shift, and you can see that while the brain shift is approximately two and a half centimeters in the you know the upper um, the right frontal lobe there, uh, the shift in the basal ganglia will be less, but it still can be significant. And this is another study from UCSF showing that you can have up to two millimeters of shift, especially with the targets that are a little bit more lateral. And here the GPI is one of those targets. That shift, unfortunately, is unpredictable. We can't just say if it shifts, it's gonna shift more posteriorly. So that's why, to me, it's incredibly important to get this live imaging. There are limitations, right? So 3T MRI, currently, both leads have to be placed in one setting because once the leads are in and locked, you cannot do any more scanning. Now, that has just recently changed. Medtronic just came out this June with leads that are MRI compatible. So we can go ahead and uh, celebrate uh, you know, the taking away of that one limitation. Uh, but we still have some difficulties if the MRI sequences that need to be utilized uh, require post-processing uh, or, you know, very time-consuming images. Let's say you need to get a full DTI that can take uh, 20 minutes. Uh, we're working on that and the majority of targets that we use now require only a sequence that's about five or six minutes long. And of course, if the patient has to be awake to see the clinical response, and that would be essential tremor, and sometimes depression. 
Although I believe that as we're making progress in this field, we will have really good markers, biomarkers that do not require that intraoperative response from the patient. We'll be able to predict it and we will not have to have these people awake. And you will still, in an elderly population, get implants that are not MRI compatible. You really do have to go back to you know, the late 80s, early 90s for this, but they still do exist. And of course, that would preclude an MRI procedure. But the benefits are a lot, right? So we said, again, accurate placements, making sure that there's no need for revisions. You see where the lead ends up before you end up closing the patient. And the gold standard for an evaluation where the lead is really is the MRI itself. And we can now again see these novel imaging like MPRAGE and FGATA that allows us to see targets, for example, in the thalamus, which have previously not been visible. Uh, focused ultrasound is another extensive and uh, wonderful new technique. It's being installed, I'm not kidding, right now as we speak. Uh, we've, they've blocked off the scanner for two weeks and uh, they can do some testing after July 10th. And by the time we're in September, we can use the system at Mount Sinai West. And drug injection trials. So just a few photos here. So again, this is the accuracy using these novel imaging techniques. This right here is the focused ultrasound, which without any incisions, but unfortunately for now with the complete shape of the head, because otherwise the ultrasound waves would get deflected, can treat lesions, broadly speaking to within about two to three centimeters of the midline by sending a lot of ultrasound waves all the way from around and focusing all in one area. Uh, and causing an ablation in that area with uh, the ultrasound energy itself. Drug injection trials are incredibly important and I think they're gonna continue to increase. Here's a sign uh, you can see on this uh, coronal on the right, the passageway of the stylet and the injection and the injection is mixed with contrast. So you can see exactly where it's spreading, in this case in the putamen uh, and the GPI to give us the ability to know where the medication's actually gone in the brain of somebody who's undergoing a gene trial in Parkinson's. Um, and now switching over to epilepsy, you know, we now have seven Tesla that we do at our center pretty much as a standard to be able to really figure out where potentially their epilepsy can live, even if it's side of the mesial temporal lobe. We can go ahead and segment these things so much better. So we'll, we're able to treat more and more patients with minimally invasive approaches. Here's our Rosa robot system. Uh, here's the minimally invasive stereo EG. Here's as small as a craniotomy can possibly be in these kind of cases, as long as you did your homework and uh, you really did narrow it down to that specific area with a minimally invasive procedure. Here's another option, minimally invasive RNS implant. Here's a resection of the S2 area in someone's left parietal lobe. You can see how small the opening can be and has to be. And if you can see this little mark right here, where um, on the, on the patient's right side, but our left side of the screen, right where the lead is sneaking in under the dura to give us some uh, motor strip information. That's the stigmata of the stereo G lead itself going in that little mark on the cortex. And here's how small the craniotomies can be if they are appropriately designed in a worked up patient. So clear point, the system we discussed before, again, as we said, it doesn't have to be used for placement of a permanent lead. Uh, it can be used to ablate a structure. And here's a quick run through that. This is also a technique that was pioneered at UCSF and has about 15 years at this point of safety and efficacy. The live updates of MR thermography are incredibly important. The MRI is able to give you temperature information of any voxel inside of the human brain. These patients go through one night hospital stay and they're usually incredibly happy because they just have one stitch in the back of their head when they wake up. So I'll let this run through a couple times, but this is the minimum invasive laser ablation itself. On the bottom, you can see the already ablated area on the sagittal cut. And on the right-hand side, you can see the initiation of the next burn, next to number one. And uh, when that burn is going, you can see that the yellow in the middle panel continues to expand backwards. So we're able to ablate most of the amygdala hippocampus complex, hopefully rendering these patients seizure-free. Patient comfort is uh, significantly improved over the open craniotomies here. And we're seeing that because we're not really messing with the lateral temporal neocortex in some well-selected patients, you can actually have the improved neuropsych. So here's an example of coronal T2s and here's an example of coronal T2s after the ablation itself takes place. Again, I think we're only starting to see how well this kind of a technique can be utilized to help in uh, any and all sorts of neurological uh, abnormalities for the patients. Responsive neuromodulation, the easiest way to explain it is 
if we can get to it easily and it's and you can live without it resection is best if you can live without it but it's hard to get to ablation is best but for cases where you need to keep it it's the place where your memories get made or it helps you move your right hand then neuromodulation is the best approach so this device right here is the first closed loop brain system approved by the fda in the united states this is back in 2013. it allows you to wait for a seizure uh, and it adjunctively treats it by recording it and trying to send the counter current to stimulate it. It is not a cure with a big asterisk. Uh, in our series, 15% of patients, one five are seizure free with this device, but we still see that the device is recording what we call long episodes, which means technically the seizures are starting, but the seizures are interrupted before they get to the level of being felt by the patient. In the literature right now, that number is 10%. And we're trying to figure out what is it that we're doing right for 10% of the patients and hopefully can apply this to the rest of them. The programming is intense and this is where we have to thank our epilepsy colleagues. They do the brunt of the work of figuring out what will actually help these patients and the degrees of freedom are immense. This is no longer DBS where you have a couple leads and just sort of turn it on. You really have exquisite freedom and in a way that's a challenge. Sinai last updated, we were again tied with Stanford for first place in the United States. And it's the only place where this is available. So I guess we can say in the world, probably somewhere around 115 implants completed uh, as of now. And unfortunately, guys, I don't think this wonderful video is going to work. So I'm going to have to go forward, but I will send it to the group through Peter and Alyssa and the rest of the team. Uh, this is one of the ways that we could explain to a patient what happens. And this is a, a skull rendering of a specific patient's 3D CT. Once their stereo is in, as well as the bone fiducials that allow us to be accurate, and then it would zoom you inside the head and show you the areas. It makes me very upset that I can't play it. So I'm just going to stop talking about it. But I'll forward it to everyone afterwards. Uh, and here's how the RNS implant works. Uh, so initially, their amplifiers were not strong enough, so they had to actually not place it subclavicular as we do standardly with DBS, but uh, place it into the skull itself and lock it in. And when I first heard of this, I thought, this is ridiculous. Why would you ever do this? Um, I have really changed my mind. The patients are incredibly comfortable. There are no moving parts because everything is locked into the skull itself. So they don't get any pooling that you get with DBS when you move your neck around. The extensions are not an issue. And also just uh, the fact that the recordings are so much better because they're closer to the source. Whereas when we're trying some of these recordings and uh, the device itself is subclavicular, sometimes it's too close to the heart and you get some interference. So here's an example of after the lead is placed with the burr hole cover, we do a full thickness craniotomy for these patients to be able to implant the ferrule, which holds the device and then place the device in place and close it up. This is chronic neuromodulation and it shows continuous improvements and this again is kind of the holy grail of neurosciences is this uh, utilization of brain plasticity. We truly see that it stops seizures with a certain level of efficacy, but we also see that less and less seizures actually come about. So there's a level of the brain saying, aha, I finally have some help and I'm able to take care of the seizures better. So year after year, they're having more and more improvement in their symptoms. The seizure-free intervals, uh, again, by these large trials right now, about 30% have more than six months of seizure freedom. Uh, patients, you know, 15, 16% have a year of seizure freedom. And 25% uh, have seizure reduction of over 90%, which we call super responders. As we stated before, the goal is to figure out what are we doing right with those folks and try to apply it to the rest. And as we said before, 15% in our series are seizure-free. So we really wanna leverage these clinical opportunities and this increased precision into productive research, right? How do we take the next step? How do we not just help this patient, but a hundred patients over the next 10 years? Well, we're working on seizure prediction algorithms for deep convoluted network analysis of G data. This is a fascinating project together with RPI, uh, the Institute is just a couple hours north of us and some exciting data coming out that we're hoping we're gonna be able to share with you guys soon. But seizure predictions, that's another holy grail. How do we tell a patient that within the next 10 minutes, they really need to get to a place where they're safe because they may fall down having a seizure. I mean, that would be life-changing for them. Quality of life outcome optimization uh, with specifically working together, right? Not just neurosurgery in their silo, neurology in their silo, radiology, psychiatry, but working together, finding out what makes the life of a patient better and then working together as a team to get there. 
And I'm going to spend the last few minutes on uh, my new pet project that I'm pushing for everyone is uh, elucidation of meditation circuitry using intracranial recordings and how we can build on that to get people to become better meditators. And you can kind of say equivalently, just better human beings. Number one, meditation works. I didn't really know this before I started researching some of this, but for the past 6,000 years, uh, we have been fairly convinced of this. And now there's evidence-based medicine to prove that it works. Uh, overwhelming evidence, well-being can be learned, right? So start thinking of this as a skill, just like some of us go to the gym or run or do crossword puzzles. The same can happen with meditation, which means we can be trained and we can continue to improve. And the baseline characteristics of every specific patient or resident and med student who needs a relief from stress are going to be different, but we can go ahead and moderate our strategies and we can go ahead and envision a future where meditation is specifically designed for your brain. And that can lead to overall increase in well-being. And that's from Richard Davidson's work that was recently published. So what are the perceived benefits of meditation? Especially if we're thinking of you guys and embarking on this incredibly challenging career and going through the interview season and junior residency and mid-level residency and chief years. There's a lot of anxiety provoking moments up ahead. Well, let's talk to the happiest person in the world. This is some of the descriptions of him and that's Matthew Ricard. So stress relief is big. You can most certainly have a time saving ability. Uh, meditation sometimes equates to a factor of that time sleeping. So 20 minutes of meditation can be the same as taking a good two hour nap. Increased ability to focus, incredibly important in our field, but also for our patients. Performance of difficult and dangerous tasks under significant pressure improves. Again, think of how this resonates to you know, our careers. And increased happiness, improved emotional regulation, the total overall boost to positive mood. I uh, wanna do a pitch here. If we pitched a movie, we're gonna pitch a book. Highly recommend Happiness by Matthew Ricard. Um, and he, I'm just realizing, wrote this together with Daniel Goldman, uh, who's one of the co-writers um, of Altered Traits, which is another great book. Uh, by Richie Davidson. So I recommend both of those to you guys. And this is just a quick map of how many places we can go ahead and enter the patient clinical workflow to be able to have them benefit, right? So neuropsychological evaluation, group-based meditation introductions, right away, the moment that the patient sees uh, neuropsychology, let's get them to meditate. Meditation during long-term care with neurology, an epileptic who's seeing the neurologist, you know, every six months for years, we can go ahead and enter the pathway there. Intensive meditation training before possible surgical applications, utilization of stereo G in those recordings during their admissions for the surgery itself, precise device implantation and lesioning, as we talked about this, right, and how they can potentially affect their meditation capability. And then some of the devices that we talked about that allow us to chronically monitor these patients can we go ahead and use those devices to augment meditation? And of course, then the clincher is utilization of the data we gather in our research to be able to help the next patient or the next 100 patients. So how do we deal with the challenges that we face in life? And specifically to bring this home, how do we deal with the past 18 months? Well, so this is from Shakespeare. Just nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So the bard was onto something. He really said that our mindset is so much more important than the actual situation. This, there's no good way to translate this from Russian, but the best I could do is Leo Tolstoy said, if you want to be happy, work hard on being happy. This is not just an accidental occurrence. This is actually us being able to change our mind and be happy. And that's where meditation can help. So we can now go ahead and leverage 6,000 years of this art. And I'm sorry, again, the reason why it's 6,000 years is they have uh, paintings of uh, human beings from about 4,000 BCE that have their eyes closed uh, and are in meditative postures. So we think it's been around for six or even 7,000 years. This can really build our resilience for us as care providers and for our patients. So future directions here, Again, the graphics are not working that well, so I'm just going to flash this all up there and we'll talk through it. Utilization of wearables to evaluate meditation states in hospital staff. We now have this little uh, 
fancy bands that allow us to get kind of a rough idea of the EEG. And while some of this is a little bit BS right now, most certainly it's a great way to at least get into the idea of behavioral feedback uh, that can be done uh, in an ambulatory situation. Intracranial stimulation with stereo, with RNS, with Percepts PC to augment meditation, or potentially just to augment the first step that is so important in meditation, and that is focused attention. Evaluation of closed loop systems, again, RNS and precepts devices for meditation biofeedback and introduction of meditation into resident and APP education. And my hope is into med student education. So again, we're getting better at training our bodies, but we really have to get better at training our minds. Uh, I think that the, the potential benefit is so much greater. So in summary, we've made some progress. It's been a few years, but we're getting there but we have so far to go yet before we truly understand how can we best help our fellow human beings and how can we best help ourselves. And the key here is we wanna work on this together, right? We do not want this to be one surgeon, one team. We want to all have this cross departmental dialogue because that's really where the serendipity will occur. That's really when we're gonna have light bulbs go all the way across the room and we'll be able to potentially come up with solutions we haven't even considered yet. So with this, I wanna thank you and the uh, incredibly diverse and large team that allows this to happen. And uh, now I'm gonna shut up and I will let the rest of you guys uh, voice any questions or comments or suggestions that you may have. And I think Peter, you can congratulate me because we do have some time to do that. Thank you again for all. Well done, staying on time. <laughs> any questions from the group? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Panov. So uh, I'm in India, and in India, uh, DBS leads have been extremely expensive. And so lesioning procedures continue to be uh, quite popular here. And while they have fallen out of favor in the US, what are your thoughts about that? And how do you see the field going forward, especially with regards to the evolution of global neurosurgery? Will we see these DBS leads getting cheaper significantly so that they can be used uh, much more? Absolutely. And again, remember, so it's just, it's really just, um, it's the fault of the system right now that these leads are not available, right? We know that the manufacturing costs of the leads are much cheaper. And we know that because once something is done with the patent portion, we can get them for free. And a clear example is, you know, generic drugs that are finally out of that 20, 20 year window. But it's up to us to continue to push this, right? To gather leads that are, let's say, close to expired just by the US standards. But we know that they're made of metals that are not gonna change, which means that you know, if something is expiring, let's use that over the next uh, five, 10 years and let's test them and make sure that they still work, but increase the outreach to other places. I think the world is becoming too small. These artificial divides are not gonna last that long. We realize you know, with this pandemic, how connected we truly are. Uh, so I wouldn't say that lesioning procedures are going to always have to be there. My goal with neurosurgery, and Peter may laugh at me, is to not do neurosurgery in the future. You know, to me, this is just a stepping stone to something that is going to be even more special, and that is neuromodulation, and that is potentially neuromodulation without incisions. We're going to be reverse engineering from stimulation in a tiny area inside the brain with a contact just there to a much more broader field effect to eventually just uh, you know a fancy high density EEG net on top of someone's head akin to some of the TMS studies that we have right now. So I think the future is bright and I think that we're gonna get past this unfortunate issue right now where things are just too expensive in a lot of um, the other parts of the world. Thank you so much. And if it's okay, I have a question from Marina here. Uh, she's saying, thank you for the presentation. You mentioned the biomarkers that could be utilized in order to eliminate the need for awake TBS. Do you refer to beta band oscillations and the evoke resonant neural activity? So yes, the ability for us to, let's say, eradicate the beta band has just been so critical and central to our ability to help Parkinsonian patients. And the amazing thing about something like beta band is it seems to be true and consistent across several, what we call circuit of circuit of pathologies, uh, which means that anytime you have a, a brain disease that relies on circuits to work, at some point we run into a beta band. And the way that I describe it to myself, because I don't have enough brain power to do otherwise, is 
think of a stadium that is all chanting the same thing or is doing the wave. It's impossible to do any other task. So if all of these uh, neurons are just kind of going up the road and they're all singing together, but not in unison that allows these beautiful things like thoughts to happen, but in a bad pathological way. And to me, that's beta band. And we can break that up. We know that stimulation breaks up the beta band uh, and that's why DBS patients feel better. So absolutely, the one critical part that's difficult is we can only do so much inside of the MRI scanner. So to me right now, the biomarkers are really gonna be you know, one degree of magnitude removed still. I truly feel that once we know more about functional uh, DTI imaging, we can go ahead and use that patient specifically to design their perfect targets for DBS or lasering or RNS. And guys, thank you again. There's, there's no pressure to come up with a question right now, but what I wanna do is uh, uh, Peter and Alyssa and the rest of the team will definitely share you know, our cell phone numbers and uh, I'm gonna type it into here so that you guys have it, uh, as well as our emails. The way this works and the way that we get better is we get honest feedback from you regarding our talks and our thoughts. Uh, and that's why I think Peter's organizing this and that's why we're so excited to interact with you guys and uh, have the new uh, powerful, stronger, better brains that are coming up in the younger generation. So please reach out about these things, especially if something caught your eye and you want to collaborate or start a research project, because that's really the way that we're gonna get things going. So much, Ted. That was a great talk and great discussion. Um, we are taking next week off because it's the July 4th holiday. But in two weeks, we have Dr. Hickman joining us to talk about neurotrauma. So looking forward to seeing you all then. Have a good night. Thank you guys so much. Have a good night.